Hi everyone, my name is Aliza. I am one of the board members of MI. Today, a uh, very important and interesting subject I'm going to hear more about it. I remember when we first uh, started discussing about uh, psychology, uh, scientific uh, technology revolution improvement in the world as a, a socialist. And we said, if we did what we, what we are going to do, what we would do if we uh, in power in these circumstances. And everybody was saying, less work in hours, less work in hours, and more time for the environment, art, and uh, human beings, vulnerable people. But, but now this development happened and keep uh, the, uh, developing, improving. And what's going on? Uh, what, what's happening in the uh, capitalist minds? What, what is waiting for actually in the capitalist world, world? I think we are going to hear about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. And thanks so much for inviting me here. So maybe I can introduce myself very briefly about my studies here in Oxford. So I'm a postdoc researcher, uh, postdoctoral researcher in uh, Oxford Department of International Development. Uh, I came to the UK about one and a half years ago from Istanbul. So I completed my PhD in Istanbul University Faculty of Political Science and I moved here as a British Academic Fellow. Uh, I've got two projects. Uh, one is about uh, uh, Turkey origin immigrants in the Western Europe, their participation to the democratic life, and the other is about the Syrian refugees in Turkey, their uh, labor market engagement. Uh, but also, very recently, I have been studying this blockchain and artificial intelligence from mostly from social, ethical, and political uh, aspects of it because. Oxford University is a kind of hub for this uh, blockchain and artificial intelligence studies. And apart from its technical studies, there are many uh, institutes on discussing the legal, political, ethical uh, aspects of the new technological revolution. So I am also following and being part of this project. So, so this is a very new issue. Uh, issue and um, I would like to just uh, share some of the um, gossips from the Oxford, what people discuss and you know what they think, and then I uh, I raise some of the questions that I try to answer in different uh, aspects of this new technological or de data driven innovation. And maybe this can be a kind of introduction meeting, and maybe we can continue discussing. And please feel free to ask any question when you would like. So, uh, and I hope it will be a good discussion. Hmm. So, here, there, I just listed some of the new, very recent developments, like in this technological field. Some of them we know and we are very used to. Like we use them all our life, but we just use it for a few years. But for example, nanotechnology and the Internet of Things, which means you connect some of the materials, uh, tools in your house to Internet. So when you are coming close to your home, then the coffee machine works and then gives you, prepares your coffee, air condition starts working, and then you open your door, the lights are turning on, kind of thing. So your devices are connected to the internet. Uh, so there is another discussion about web uh, 2.0, there's semantic web, there's cloud computing, Com computing we start using, downloading our photos there, uh, motion capturing games, like smartphone apps we all use in our daily lives. I, I found this place by using these applications. I think we are all used to using tablets and touch screens and GPS augmented reality and we are discussing about the uh, driver's cars, you know, Uber's driver's car killed someone in, the, in Arizona. So who is responsible from this accident? Because there is no driver, kind of. Uh, we talk about unmanned drones, you know, Turkish military is very proud of their unmanned drones in the last uh, military uh, occupation. 
uh, we are talking about artificial companions, mm -hmm. wearable computing devices, you know, all, you know, we are talking about identity theft. Uh, my identity was stolen, kind of. So this is an interesting issue. So we are all used to these online courses. Then we are use, using the social media in our life. You know, before we go to that, we look at the social media. Then we get up, we look at the social media. And now, maybe you follow all these recent scandals of Facebook and Cambridge Analytics that, you know, even you use social media to connect with other people, then you, some companies can manipulate your understandings and then and we are talking about cyber war, like Britain is accusing Russia, you know, kind of things. So, so these are very recent issues and, you know, maybe 10 years ago we weren't talking these in our daily lives. But, you know, for example, if you talk about artificial intelligence, it has been debated since 1950s. So it's not very new in the science. Or when we talk about blockchain technology, it is it was around since 1990s. But in the last few years, we started discussing these concepts in our daily lives. So there is a kind of change because companies started to invest in these uh, technologies. So there is, they spend so much money uh, to develop these technological issues. So it becomes part of our life. And uh, maybe we can discuss this uh, you can share your ideas as well, but maybe I, I believe this is kind of cool. Uh, it has direct relation with the current global uh, crisis of capitalism because in order to overcome the crisis, capitalism or car com companies invest in new technologies and so they invest in the new means of productions to overcome the crisis. However, such a process then contradicts with the again with the forces of production and a new crisis occurs, occurs. So, so this is another question that we can discuss. So if we know artificial intelligence is 1950s, why are we discussing this in the last two years? Kind of thing? So, um, but you know, these technological developments are very exciting issues, you know, these data-driven innovation are very valuable for humanity, I believe so, but but yeah, um, in the hands of capitalism and corporations, it's not supposed to serve to the needs of the people. Then we see, for example, blockchain from you know uh, the supporting or investing in financial capitalism from the you know these very speculative cryptocurrencies. So in order, instead of serving to the people needs of the people, then they use blockchain for the financial means or. Uh, we use uh, uh, artificial intelligence in military, so they invest in military or create new bombs. But we can also use this in other areas as well. Or even you know the social media can be used to manipulate me messages. So we have the technology, but the logic behind you know how is important. You know, who uses this technology and which, which aims? Uh, so. Maybe a few concepts that you we discuss in the literature, like so. For example, we are talking about the fourth revolution. So, what is this fourth revolution in the fourth technological revolution? So, the first revolution is Copernican revolution, supposed to be. So, with the Copernican revolution, we understand that we are not in the center of the universe. So, it changed our mind and perceptions towards the universe. Then there's the Darwinian revolution that so. We are not unique creatures, we are animals. And then the Freudian revolution, so we say we are part of the animal world, but okay, we are very conscious, so we have our mind, but Freud shows that we are not doing everything consciously, or some animals can have some kind of mind. And this new technological revolution is supposed to be, it's the, kind of say, it's the down of the new technological revolution, so we understand that we are not the smartest. So, <laughs> uh, and let's see uh, if this, so this is maybe early stages of this new technological revolution. And another discussion of 
in you know maybe we you can share your ideas as well. So maybe we are in the new stage of the history. So for example, an Ito Italian professor, it, a philosopher in Oxford, Florida, uh, argues that we are now living the hyperhistory. So we the humanity passed from the prehistory, the hunter-gathering period, then there was the history period, but now we are in the hyper-history. So for the first time in the world, humanity can, the human beings can connect with anyone in the different parts of the world. So if, even if you live in a small village, you are not just surrounded with these people around, so you can connect with anyone in the world, in the other parts of the world. And secondly, before we could make distinction between being online and offline so if you turn on your computer turn off your computer if you turn off the wi-fi then you are offline but now there is no such difference now being being online or offline you are always online so it's like they call this they are on life so they have a kind of new manifesto about being on life so that means in all each minute in our life we use this kind of some smartphone applications to find our address you know we use in different uh, uh, items that are connected to internet so all our life can be traced from um, all these uh, um, signals provided by your car or your coffee machine or maybe your smartphone because all are uh, connected to internet so you are living in a new phase of the history that's very high part so this, these are the uh, uh, issues that is st started to be debated so we can give different answers so we are not necessarily accept these are as a scientific results but you know these are some psych philosophical debates uh, but now we have some artificial digital and synthetic friends so uh, we are connecting with machines we are learning from machines and machines are connecting with machines so this is very uh, interesting that machines interacting with other machines and finding a way to each other so then we start talking about big data but this is another issue because when you talk about big data how big it is so there is no any limit for this so for instance when I was talking with a colleague in Oxford now I will tell this project if you minutes later about the one year long telephone mobile phone data of one million people is a big data for me and they made fun of me it's not big yeah. Yeah. so there is no in the limit for this and every year every moment we this concept of big changes so in this big so because all people having a smartphone uh, all people having some uh, uh, item that connects with the internet uh, leave some traces behind it, so it can be followed, so we cannot hide ourselves from this situation. So um, all this data is going somewhere and so it collects in the universe and it is not possible for any of the human beings to dig in uh, this data and find the solution, reach a solution. So we have these machines who use all this data based on some modules, uh, models and they give you some kind of uh, decisions so this is the meaning basic the meaning of the artificial intelligence but so so this is the question of about what will we do with all this data you know all your facebook links ticks all your likes all uh, your search in the internet, you know, mm, all your uh, use of you know these applications, all these kind of give some information, uh, provide some information, and so 
it's in now a new area of a, a new field of discipline how to deal with all this data so we know so much data that is that is not comparable in the history um, for instance in this Cambridge Analytica scandal they they used 50 million Facebook pages and supported Trump. Yeah. This is the main issue. This is a kind of scandal, but this, everything is legal. I think this is more, it's the bigger problem. So because if someone does something illegally, you can say, okay, this is an illegal issue, but if it is illegal, if it's, everything is according to the rules, then this is, I think, a bigger problem. So people can use and can manipulate you. And they use the uh, model based, uh, developed by a professor from, the camp, from Cambridge and according to him a, a, a Facebook algorithm can know you better than your workmates if you like 50 posts if you like 150 posts he knows you, the algorithm knows you better than your wife or husband and if you like more than 250 uh, posts, that algorithm knows you better than you, yourself. So, yeah. this is like, so all this Cambridge Analytica model is based on this uh, result. So you know a guy is talking about giving sharing the secrets of the uh, company. So he says, "We know you better than yourself. We know your fears." We know your hopes, so we send messages according to your fears and hopes, and you don't know these fears because you know it's an issue. And you don't, you can, you know, you are fearing of some issues, but you don't know everything. Some, it's, you can understand it when you experience it. So it's a kind of fear, and uh, Facebook knows this. Facebook can understand this based on your sharings. Yeah. So this is an issue because it's free for you, you can, be, you can have a Facebook page free, but Facebook earns money from the data you share. You create this data for Facebook and Facebook sells this to companies or other uh, parties. For instance, these are all very tailored issues, the tailored results. For example, if, if we search the same word in Google, we have different results. For example, if I'm um, really very interested to politics, and if you are interested on tourism, and if you search Turkey, I will get results about the politics of Turkey. While you are, you will get some of the tourist destination. You know, the Google will give you the best hotels. You know, and but Google will share with me the politics of Turkey. Kind of. So it's very tailored results. Or if you use the Booking.com. Based on your previous choices, they will give you uh, the hotels that you would like more. So it's not the same results that everybody has. So you can also use this to send some messages to people for political purposes as well. So we can talk about this Cambridge scandal, uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal more if you like. Uh, but you know this is. Uh, what I want to show in this kind of introduction part is, you know, this is something that we haven't experienced before, all this data. This makes your life a lot easier, so I can easily find my way from Oxford to here, based on Google Maps. And now I cannot even find anywhere without GPS <laughs> or this directions of the Google, so I'm just looking at which way I should go, but before I should find my way based on uh, okay, say asking some people or you know, you know I, but I can easily say I'm coming to uh, this room in London that I haven't been in before, but I'm trusting to Google Maps, I know <laughs> that application will show me the way and I will come, so this is an issue and this Google by asking this question to Google, the Google knows that where I will go. So, so I sent this message to them. So, for example, um, now uh, we will start a new project in Oxford. 
with a group of academics from that in mathematical institute and our refugee studies center. Türk Telekom in Turkey will share one million mobile phone data of Syrian refugees. So one million Syrian refugees having the SIM cards of Türk Telekom companies. And they will share their one year long conversations with us. So it's very anonymized, so we don't know the people, we don't know what they talk about, but we know who they talk with. So, uh, if these refugees are talking with locals or with other refugees, are they talking with people in their town or in other towns, based on their geolocations? So, this information will give us their social networks and we will understand how they find their jobs. So, if a refugee is phoning from Antep to Istanbul, or someone in Germany, we understand that he's trying to learn something, the life in Istanbul or life in Germany. Then, if we find that phone comes to Istanbul, <laughs> we can just understand where he will reside in Istanbul, in the rich district or in the poor district. And then we will, if, they, if he stays there, we will understand his job, presumably. His living here and then he was going to the, the an industrial center so he finds the job in a factory kind of so this is i think very an amazing issue <laughs> you know one million people having kind of to, speaking with their friends for one year long and you can understand their economic uh, conditions their friends their social networks and then I, I can write some kind of uh, analysis about it, write some kind of reports. And this is owned by the state as well. So they just share a kind, a small part of it. This is very, uh, such a model is very popular for the African studies. Because in Africa, states are, many states are very weak. And they cannot may search their people. So it's very difficult to make so, uh, research for the people, to understand their economic well-being or their issues. But everybody has a mobile phone. And all these mobile phones are owned by some European corporations. So we, we can understand or we can assume economic crisis based on their mobile phone data. For example, if they are Topping up their mobile phones or not. If they are phoning people in their own local area if, or if they are phoning other places. So we can understand their migration routes. We can understand their economic perceptions. You know? Because if you are not happy in your town or if you are looking for a job, if you are unemployed, you will phone other people living in other cities. But if you are having a job, if you are happy in your town, you will have communication with your locals. And maybe you can phone some your father or mother, you know, a kind of relative sometimes, you know. So you do not phone other cities or other countries every day, you know. So you can assume the economic situation. Or even, for example, in the recent Ebola crisis, based on the mobile phone, so there's, there was an Ebola uh, crisis in some parts of Africa and people were trying to leave there but if they leave then they will spread the illnesses so based on the mobile phone data the World Health Organization can trace the movements of the migration and then they could stop the crisis so they use this data to stop and uh, eliminate the illness or in China you use this face recognition uh, applications to understand if there is a, any potential threat for an uprising or not. Because, because I'm coming here from Oxford Street, there are thousands of people shopping around, but everybody is moving individually. But when there is a preparation for an uprising, 
then you will see people are moving in a kind of coordination. You know, people have some kind of coordinated uh, moves because they are going to and pro join a protest. So based on this uh, application, the application warns police that there is an issue there. There, can, there might be a big demonstration kind of thing. So these are all information that they can collect from our mobile phones or from the cameras around. And all these applications use all this data for, collected from thousands of or millions of people and they reach a judgment. So this is the this is a very new issue, but as I said, we can discuss this afterwards. But we can use all this technology for the good good of the, or for the well-being of the people. But we can all use this technology to manipulate people, to get more money from them, or to make more surveillance over them. You know? So this is an an other issue. Uh, <coughs> so. Um, Um, I, I won't go to the technical uh, issues of the blockchain, so I'm not a computer scientist. Um, and I will try to introduce you about the other uh, areas that blockchain can be used. So, we all know blockchain from Bitcoin or these speculative cryptocurrencies. And as I understand, you had a, a, another seminar about block, uh, Bitcoin issues. So this is still a very um, lively issue, but blockchain is a new technology that will be used in all other fields. Even maybe in the future, we will sign all our contracts based on blockchain. Uh, most probably, so we, we spend, so you don't have to just invest or transfer money. So it's not just a financial issue. So, blockchain is a distributed ledger technology, that means it is not, uh, there is no any central authority, so it's, there is no any central ledger. It provides services rapidly and cheaply through cryptographic security, so it's the result of a cryptographic uh, science, uh, a, a different science field. So, uh, there is no any intermediary. So it's transparent that account, there is an accountability, so uh, everybody knows all the transfers, but in order to understand the content of the transfer, that block, you, have, you should have the key for the uh, password, you should have the password. Without the password you cannot open it, but you can see it, you can verify it. You know, this is the main logic behind it. In to Today's world, we use central authorities, like central banks or state, to verify our agreements or to verify our transfer of money. So we ask from a bank to transfer this money to another person. So the bank gets its fee. So it's the central authority there. But now, based on the cryptography, if I ha if I know the password and if I if the other if my friend knows the password if just two of us knows the password, I can transfer this money to you and nobody get, can take the money because they should have the password. So this is the main logic behind it. So it is decentralized and serverless. There is no any central server. So for instance, in Turkey there is this e-state service. So there is an electronic state. So sometimes we get information like someone hacked and get all information from the e-state, you know. They all know our identity because there is this, a central server. So if you can hack it, you can get the information. But if there is no in a central uh, server, if everything is known by everyone, if it is open and transparent, uh, you can get the necessary information if you know the password. If you don't know the password, you can know there is a transaction there, but you don't know the content of it. So this is very interesting. So. But it is supposed to be used against the central banks, but now central banks are using this. So, you know, in, this is the, maybe a creativity of the capitalism here, you know. You do something, you think it's against the capitalism, 
is against the central banks, is against the state, but they can just change it, change the content, and use the technology. So, uh, yeah. But this is not just about the Bitcoin, so blockchain. So it is used for many humanitarian projects to support refugees. So, uh, for example, uh, I give some of the information. Like this person is a kind of a comp blockchain-based company who is tracking the distribution of aid. So the main logic behind this is the uh, governments of the global north, the rich countries, rich capitalist countries, they they are donors for. Uh, Sub-humanitarian projects, so they give money to some NGOs, and these NGOs go uh, to some poor countries and help people there. Like there's an earthquake in Haiti, and then English NGOs go and help these people in Haiti, right? Uh, however, or for example, there's a refugee crisis in Turkey, and the EU sends money to the to Turkey. But the main problem is because of the intermediary <coughs> bureaucracy of these countries, there is big corruption. So nobody trusts to the bureaucracy in these developing countries. So you send them uh, like millions of pounds, but the re refugees or the victims of the earthquake cannot get the money. So this is the main problem in today's world. So like UK says, oh, I got the development aid. I spent this amount of money to Africa, Asia, Latin America, but these corrupted bureaucrats or the governments they get this money and they do not spend it for the people so now with the, by using the blockchain technology i can just send this money to refugee on the ground because these intermediaries these bureaucrats authorities in that area they don't know the password of the uh, uh, block we, they call it block so um, they don't know the password of this in transaction so if you know this uh, local NGO activist in the uh, field knows it get the money and gives it to people shares it to people so it's the main. and then I will talk a bit more about this uh, UN World Food Program but it's called blockchain against hunger so another emergency cash assistance it's used in Jordan but I will give you a bit more information about it then so there is another one called Banku identifies refugees and unbanked people so this is an interesting concept that we will discuss again it's being unbanked and so there is another one called for the medical passport there is save the children's humanitarian passports so, mm, so yeah some healthcare records so all the main uh, logic, be, so this, we can see this, blockchain is used for wide, uh, very, very tough areas. So this blockchain against hunger is the United Nations program. It's a pilot project uh, used in J Jordan's Azraq camp for Syrian refugees, for over 10,000 Syrian refugees. So, this World Food Program relies on biometric registration data provided by the refugee organization of the UN. And refugees can shop from the local supermarkets based on their iris scan. So they go to the market, there is a special machine there, so they scan your iris. And then they just reach your bank account and you buy buy from this account. So you don't have a cash because they say we spend, send money to the woman, refugee woman, but their husband takes it. We send the money to the vulnerable people, but there are some gang groups or mafia groups there, they just take the money. Or the authorities, they want money, bribery kind of thing. So we don't want it. So there is no any cash. We send this money to you. And by using your iris scan, by scanning your iris, you just look at the machine and then directly we get to your bank account you have this 1000 pound in your bank account and you can do whatever you can do or whatever shopping you like so you cannot force that woman to give your that money to you yeah. so these are not 
to have a kind of humanitarian project, and it's, it's very, I think it's very nice project. <laughs> so another issue is about the digital identity. So I give you quotes from two uh, important people. So World Bank President says, digital identity is the greatest power to killer. Or the MasterCard vice chairman says, if this initiative is successful, so this is supported by United Nations, an additional 500 million new consumers and 40 million new merchants can be brought into the global economy from among the world's 2 billion unbanked people. So again, we see this unbanked. I don't know if you have heard it before, but it was very interesting to be. What's to be unbanked, you know? Uh, but what is the main issue? So digital identity, so we all have identity, but in the, uh, so it's all our, like, it's registered in the states, it's, it's, uh, registers when we, we are born, we are born, and uh, we have all this data, but over 2 billion people don't have this kind of identity in the global south. So everybody don't have this identity. And so they should have an identity based on this, so this is said the United Nations is a part of their sustainability goals. They say everybody should have a digital identity. But this, we can start from refugees, because when refugees flee to flee another country, they do not just need food, they also need, for example, mobile phone because they will communicate with people behind or they will try to find where they should go. So people need other issues. They need bank account. So we can send aid to them, we can support them, but how they can spend it? Or if you want to support the, the business, refugee business, the, the, how can we do this? So, if, so this is the main issue in the refugee crisis. Because everybody is trying to come here, and uh, Europe tries to stop refugees. So they want to keep them in the neighboring countries. But these neighboring countries are also very poor. So they've got high un unemployment rate, you know. So, uh, and the refugee crisis continues for decades, for years. So it's not just for a few years, so you cannot just send aid to them. You cannot just send money all the time. So they should have their own jobs. They should have their own business. So this is the main lo mainstream logic now. So let's send some money to the to refugee community in Turkey, in Jordan, in Kenya, in South Africa. Then they can use this money, and some of them can be workers, and some of them can be business people. So we can use their uh, skills. So. Um, uh, <coughs> this is the main logic to s solve the refugee crisis, but they should first they should have a bank account to start a business or to work, or they should have a work permit, and they should have a SIM card. This is very important for refugees. So when this is the main demand of the refugees, when they go to Greece or when they go to Bangladesh, when they go to the next country, before f uh, bread they want a SIM card because they need to communicate with the people. In the, that they left, and they want to find new people to, you know, or they should communicate with the new networks to come to move the, from that city to another. City. But if you don't have an identity, you cannot get a SIM card. If you don't have an identity, you can't get a bank account. You should have an identity card. And most states do not want to give this identity because they don't want refugees as well. So what will uh, you UN do and what these com companies support? They say we, let's give them digital identity, so they can have SIM card, they can have a bank account, so they can be empowered, so they can uh, decide on their fate. So they will get some amount of uh, aid, and based on this aid, based on their skills, they will decide whatever they should do. So they will not be dependent. Uh, so they want to use this blockchain technology because you don't need state, you don't need a central authority. So this is the main uh, logic behind this digital identity. So these are some projects about 
the blockchain in our daily lives. However, we should ask some more questions about this. Uh, okay. Uh, do all this means that people are in, are empowered? So my first question is this. So if a refugee has a digital identity, so he can have a SIM card and a bank account, he can have a work, work permit. So these are kind of progress, of course, without having you will have in a more uh, you will be in a in worse position. But is this the solution of the refugee crisis? I don't think so. So a Syrian refugee in Istanbul or in Amman live in the poor districts of Istanbul and Amman with the poor working people of the local uh, people in Istanbul and Amman, for example. And they will have similar problems. So they have work permit, okay, they have bank account, but having a bank account doesn't mean that you are empowered because you should have some money in that bank account. If without the money, this bank account doesn't mean anything. You can have SIM card, but you don't mean that you are you can survive easily. So you will have similar, uh, you will be in a similar position with a local person, but you will be subject to the same inequalities or discriminations of that society. Even if you have it, so this is is supposed to be a kind of victory, a, a kind of solution to the refugee crisis, but this doesn't mean that you are you will be free of all these problems, so you, you will not be empowered. And second, is there a risk of abuse? So, as I said, all this data that we share can be manipulated by corporations or states, so even the people like us, who are not def uh, defined as well in vulnerable positions, so we are not in a vulnerable position, but we can be manipulated by these corporations and states. So, if you think of refugees who are in vulnerable positions, they can be manipulated in a very easy way with the mobile phone and you that is supplied to them. So, another issue, with these all bank accounts and shoppings and all this data you produce through with your mobile phone and internet, you, these refugee communities can be traced and controlled and mobilized by the states. So if the if European states don't want these refugees to come to Europe, they can easily use these mobile phones and in all these thing uh, services to um, mobilize them in a certain direction. So there is a kind of a risk of abuse here. And then, what's the real uh, goal of corporations? So the corporations are supporting these projects as a kind of social responsibility issue. So they want to support and solve this humanitarian crisis, so it's a kind of a uh, holy goal for them. Uh, but they are talking about, they are not talking about refugees or kind of things, but they are talking about unbanked people. They are talking about customers. They are talking about merchants. So we start talking about the refugee crisis, like 60 million people are refugees. Then the topic just trans changed to a different direction. Then we started talking about 2 billion unbanked people. 1, bi one billion uh, people without identities. Uh, so I think there is another side of it. So for corporations, <coughs> these are not... Uh, uh, philanthropy, so they are aiming some kind of profit, but it is not a good idea to get to take some profit from refugees from a humanitarian sense, openly. So you start uh, the refugee crisis is a reason to reach these two billion people that you can address. So if you're a bank, uh, if you're a financial institution and you want to reach these two billion people, you want to reach this new market, but you cannot force people to have bank account, you cannot force their governments to invest 
for these bank accounts or internet or mobile phones, these kind of things. So it's a good idea to start from refugees. So if you want to help refugees, if you want to send them money, if you want to empower them, you should invest to the countries who refugees live. And where do these refugees live? They live in the neighboring countries in the north, southern world, where most of these unbanked people that live. So where these financial capitalists cannot reach. So if you invest to support refugees, of course the local people will get from it. So if you uh, invest refugees to have uh, bank accounts, then the locals will have bank accounts. So instead of, okay, I want you to be my uh, customer, you start investing in these countries to support refugees. And you easily, when you reach 60 million refugees, you can easily reach the remaining uh, 2 billion people. So, again, uh, this, is a, this is a kind of contradiction for me here. So the blockchain is a very um, exciting innovation, so it can be used very well. So you can help people, you can empower people, you can use it for some good cause, but this can also be used for the um, um, interest of the capitalist corporations and more surveillance, more profit, or maybe it's a kind of new markets, new, yeah. So I would pass to a different subject. And then if you have any questions, you can ask for. Shall we continue? Or I propose that we finish and then... Ah, okay. Okay. So, I will not go very deep for this issue. So, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we generally talk about the future of the work. So, will there, what will be the uh, labor, you know, what will be the future of the work kind of things. Uh, I will not go deep on these issues, but what I would like to say is this artificial intelligence is not an issue of the future, it's in our life. So it's around us, so when you apply for a loan from a bank, an artificial intelligence uh, algorithm decides it. Uh, in the US, mainly in the judiciary system, in for uh, the artificial intelligence is used. In the health system, it is used. Uh, police uses it. So there's this is the uh, this is an issue of our daily lives. So um, we talk. Uh, we like to discuss about speculating about the future of the labor, like will there be. <coughs> even robots take our jobs kind of things, but it is now used in our, so this is not something that, uh, about the future. So this is the today's issue. And for example, new works, uh, new jobs emerge um, in this process. Uh, so for example, I will give an example in a minute, but so when we talk about artificial intelligence, we are talking about a mess, we, massive undertaking of data collection that cannot be used and analyzed by human beings and then these computers are trained by this data based on a model created by computer scientists and then based on this data and mo model the machine learns and drives meanings and they give they reach to a judgment. So you give this mission about one million documents or two billion documents. The mission, the computer analyzes it in a few minutes and based on your model, they give a decision. Uh, there are different methods of teaching or training missions. You can show different photos, for example, the, the basic way. So what is this? This is a tree or uh, car. This is car. 
Okay, the machine learns. And then if you show so many information, the machine starts learning. So the, this is the logic behind the driver's cars. So they use these kind of machine learning and they, uh, and based on the sensors, they uh, work. And do you know where is the biggest artificial intelligence machine learning factory in the world? So there is a kind of factory that people train machines, hundreds of workers work. And where can it be? Military. Hmm? Military. Yeah. In which country? South Africa. Hmm. Yeah. So when we talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, maybe we are talking about we can think about Silicon Valley, US or UK or these kind of but the biggest factory of the artificial intelligence is in Africa, in Central Africa. Because our the second biggest factory is in Lebanon. So the people in Africa or the refugees in Lebanon, every day they are coming to the work. It's a kind of big open area in Africa. They sit on a table and they show thousands of photos to the machine. Machine scans and they say this is a tree, this is a car, this is this, this is this kind of thing. So the people do not know anything about what happens there. They just do this, show the photo and uh, 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 confirms if the machine is right or not. But all this information goes to the uh, um, big corporations in the US and then they use this and they as uh, uh, to introduce new technology, you know. So it's not something just used in the high used by high skilled labor in the global north, but this creates a new kind of jobs. Maybe some jobs will, uh, we will not have some jobs in the future, but we will have new jobs. But it's another kind of exploitation of people in poorer countries, or like the exploitation of refugees, just uh, doing a very simple thing, you know, this is very simple. This is a photo and I show this, and I confirm it. And I take another photo and show it. And but the machine learns it as a result of the algorithm. And then a company in the US uh, introduces a driverless car. You know. uh, so I will go back to the supply chain management because I think it's more, uh, you know, it's, it, it's maybe, I don't say it's kind of more important, but that we can test the future of industrial relations via the supply chain management. So when I talk about supply chain management, I'm talking about the hierarchical structure of production. So global corporations, the, these monopolies, they have supplier companies all over the countries, all over the world, and the workers, millions of workers work for them. For example, let's take Mark and Spencer or H&M. Garment high street factories, companies, they don't have any factory. Marks and Spencer, Zara, or H&M, but they produce from all parts of the world. They have suppliers in all parts of the world, in Turkey, in Bangladesh. And in Turkey, 100,000 workers work for Zara. Over 100,000 textile workers in Turkey work for H&M. Uh, so, and over 1,000 supplier companies work for them. So these supplier companies are business companies but they are just producing for this global corporation. So when you go to Zara or Marks and Spencer or H&M, you can see it's made in Turkey, made in Bangladesh, kind of thing. So these companies, the headquarters are exactly very small, a few hundred people work, but they manage all the supply chain. So it's very interesting for the relationship between the working class and the bourgeoisie, for example, in Turkey, because you cannot just counter or challenge the local bourgeoisie because they are producing for another a monopoly in Europe or in the US. So you know, maybe you can you could read a, some new. It was a very recent development. Like is Turkish company doesn't pay the wages of the Turkish textile workers, and then they campaigned in Zara stores, and Zara accepted to pay them. 
there are several spins, you know, kind of, because we produce Zara, you, for Zara, so you should pay for it, kind of. Uh, so in the supply chain management, generally, uh, this artificial intelligence is used to uh, convince their customers. So it's generally now, you know, the current artificial intelligence algor algorithms is focusing on uh, the relationship between companies and uh, customers. For instance, Companies want you to like their web page, Facebook pages. So, for example, you go and like the Facebook page of Zara. And when you go to a Zara store, or when you go to a MS store, H&M store, the camera, based on the camera for your face recognition, the company, the store manager, understands who you are, <coughs> finds you from the Facebook page, <coughs> And then the algorithm checks your Facebook page, understands what you like, what you wear. If you purchase anything for that store, they also think about it. And then they inform the sales assistant, come to you and give you a discount from the set a specific section of that store that you would probably buy more you know, so. That's, yeah. Mm, yeah. so this is kind if you know if you employ even 10 people they cannot do this but an algorithm can do this from the camera they he rec the algorithm recognizes your face then because you like the Facebook page they found you Facebook page and then they he the algorithm checks your History and understands what you wear, what you like, kind of things, and then they offer you discount from like shirt or from skirts, you know, from <laughs> so this is used in today's uh, world, you know. So this is not a kind of a future. Uh, it's not a, a project for the future. So this is used. So now. We are in the process, so this is very early stage. So this is a kind of maybe this can be considered as very dangerous as well. So because they know everything about you and then they can mobilize you easily. Uh, so then we come to the debates on the ethics and politics and legality of the artificial intelligence. So maybe we can discuss about the future of the world or if robots take our jobs or kind of things or if we start working with robots kind of things. But the actually, we are now in the process of understanding the potential and impact of this artificial intelligence, and we can start discussing its ethics and politics and of it. Yeah. So, for example, meet some unions, trade unions, or some uh, oppositional movements discuss how workers or trade unions participate in this process. So, you know, it's a kind of speculation to discuss if robo whether robots take my job or not. I think we should discuss this, but in our daily life, maybe in the today's collective bargaining agreements, we should discuss how we can intervene to the, uh, the to this machine learning process, how can we express our interests to these algorithms? So, we, if we are teaching a machine to decide, a, for example, a company uh, like a global corporation teaches a machine how to manage the supply chain. So, what they teach, they teach. Um, they want from the company uh, algorithm, this artificial intelligence, to decide how much amount of order they should give to which supplier. So the algorithm will compare the prices of different countries. So if they want a shirt, maybe they can 
uh, order from a Turkish company. If they want a t-shirt, they can order from a Bangladeshi company. And then they will compare the prices of different, these thousands of corporations and they will decide, uh, they will uh, have to decide where, which amount, where to order and which amount to order. Uh, so this can affect the lives of the millions of workers, of course, because if you stop ordering from a company, then they can lose, all the workers can lose their jobs. And if machines can think these issues, then they can also uh, learn human rights, labor rights, and then they can take these kind of issues as a, a Mm, yeah, so they can think, so they can start using this, the social and human rights or labor rights issues when they think of it. So they do not necessarily go to the cheapest place, but maybe they can prefer to order from a unionized workplace, for instance. If a union, like in Zara, for example, a very militant Commission of Sobreras is organized in Zara, in Spain, and they've got some collective agreements, or some maybe trade unions in Turkey or uh, signing in the UK signing collective agreement with Marx and Spencer. Maybe they can put this article in the collective agreement that they want to control all these machine learning processes. Kind of. So we can uh, defend that. The missions can learn human rights or the labor rights kind of things. Hmm? Okay. Ah, okay, okay, I'm kind of not. So, the main discussion around ethics and politics of the artificial intelligence is if this mission produces objective judgments and if it doesn't legitimize existing discrimination or inequalities. For instance, an artificial intelligence who is which is working for a human resources company and you are looking for a CEO and you have candidates but the machine learns that looks at the data thousands of data about CEOs and the machine finds that all of the CEOs are male so they can just they will, the machine will not choose a woman in that position so in a gender race or, for example, in, in the U.S., an artificial intelligence who is helping to judge, to give a decision, generally gives high scores of criminality to black people. Or when police is using a neighbor uh, artificial intelligence, where to uh, mm, patrol, where to deploy more forces, the in artificial intelligence gives advices to send police to the black neighborhoods. Why? Because the, you give a certain data and this data gives you the uh, percentage that there is more crime in black neighborhoods, for instance. So, it gives this decision. Then, you should explain the other sources, other factors to this machine learning process to change this these kind of discriminations. So it shouldn't uh, like for example this voice there is a voice recognition software but it struggles to understand women. You know the crime prediction algorithm targets black neighborhoods kind of or they give uh, you know more likely to show men highly paid executive jobs kind of this. So there is a debate, a very contemporary debate, to uh, include ethics during the design process. So the ethics by design is a kind of a concept to de uh, develop accountability and transparency of these algorithms. And I can conclude with these 10 principles of ethical artificial intelligence released by Uni Global Trade Union. It's a global trade union of service industry. So I will not read all of them, but for example, the number one is workers must have access to and influence over data collected on them. 
So if the uh, hum, an algorithm helping to human resources uh, gives a decision about an employees, employees should know the process and employees should express their interest as well. Or <coughs> so this data processing must be transparent. Uh, privacy laws must be respected throughout the company. So, for example, I give my mobile phone to the company, and the company shouldn't follow me in the uh, after work time. So, you know, uh, when a worker is uh, fired, or when workers demand to of a wage increase is rejected, kind of. There should be a clear explanation to the worker. So it's not the mission decides this. You, know, you cannot just say this. So why mission decides this? according to you should have an access to it. Um, so personal identifiable information must be exempt, kind of. So these are the ten principles of ethical artificial intelligence. So this will directly related to the worker struggles in the workplaces. So most probably, my last sentence, in the near future, we will start working with some kind of machines. Now, as today we use computers in our daily lives, but tomorrow we will start communicating with computers, having artificial intelligence to do our work in the workplace. And uh, at this moment, we should we can we should have some uh, rights to influence or change these kind of decisions because when it is said that the computer decides, it comes to you as a kind of objective judgment because it's not a human; it's your supervisor who doesn't like you. It's the computer who doesn't know you. So it's not, it's not supposed to be an objective decision. So the unions or the worker organizations in this uh, stage of the history can uh, uh, struggle to access this machine learning process and should maybe put these kind of articles in the equality agreements. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Bugün evet. bizi gözetliyor. <gülüyor> Sadece oraya alıyorsun. Okay, who is going to be first? Questions first. Okay, in these conversations as well, with the role of te that technology has played around the world. Mm -hmm. There's the skepticist view that the, they maintain that the nation state isn't, that isn't undermined by globalization. Mm -hmm. And that the other kind is that the globalists believe that technology itself has undermined mm -hmm. the borders of the nation state and is the next best thing for the world as the internet for instance has connected everybody and there's the idea of everything being reduced to data is until it goes back to the 19th century with Edda Lovelace mm -hmm. said to be the the inventor of the program for computers and she came up with this mathematical idea that one day people will be or things everything in the world will be reduced to data and also the world wish believe that the best way and the skeptics also believe that globally there, there's no such thing as a world culture mm -hmm. and that world wish believe that the next thing is the multi-tier global governance system mm -hmm. um, now within the context of Turkey which had a EU-Turkey mm -hmm. deal over the issue of refugees mm -hmm. Which camp do you belong in? Do you belong in a skepticist? As uh, somebody who studies international mm -hmm. development, is 
Are you in the skepticist camp or the globalist camp? Mm. So, how should we take some questions first and then answer or question answer? Yeah. How can we do? Okay. Maybe we can take three questions. Okay, okay another one. Thank you. One simple question. Uh, we as a socialist don't like the class society, but we always said that the class based on the addition of labor. Mm -hmm. So how this issue will affect the division of labor? Excuse me. Now, the, thank you for the seminar. It was uh, beautiful. Uh, if we had more time, we would have learned even more, I'm sure. But the uh, problem with this presentation is that it is mostly about technology and the uh, how to use it in a neutral sense. But we know on the other hand that all decisions are political decisions. It depends who takes what decision. You can make a hell out of all this, what you have told us. For example, you can use all the drones to kill people as Americans kill in Afghanistan, Turks kill in uh, Syria, and all these technologies can be used for recognition of so-called regime oppos oppositionals in cities, even in districts and so on and so on. You can make a derivation of lots of problems, lots of uh, counter-revolutionary measures by the state, or you can create a paradise. What I understand from what you told is, for example, that there is, it is a recognition of one world market and blockchain or chain of blocks is showing us how trade is going to be gradually abolished because at the very end you can buy things from one person to another person, uh, eliminating all the intermediaries. In the future, there won't be even necessary to have trade at all. It will be all uh, uh, electronic uh, communication and transport and so on. So how shall we solve this political problem? And, you can, and, it, and it will go on. For example. Yeah, yeah, you can. Make a bank of the identity take of this, positions. Yeah, take this Cambridge Analytica. Now I suspect that Brexit vote and the uh, tendency of some worker uh, groups voting for Brexit and gaining the majority is actually a plot by the British state who didn't want to follow the Germans in European Union. That can easily be said. It is already written in the newspapers that Trump is elected using Cambridge Analytica's help. So the political side is very, very important. Changing down in Turkey is three questions. Uh, so very interesting questions, and um, so all these things are political, first thing. So uh, I will try to answer or uh, uh, share my comments to all questions. But uh, yeah, when for example when I was first reading blockchain, I said that's great because we were reading that. Uh, there will be a classless, stateless society, but how will it be? Okay, we read, okay, we, if we do these, these things, then there will be a classless society, there will, be, there will not be any need for a state, and people will not have, have any requirement to work. But how will it be? Now, we can give an answer from today's technology. We can say, we don't need a state, we don't need a central authority, we can use a form of blockchain in the future or 
there are many discussions about the bureaucracy in the socialist regimes or the people's power in the socialist regimes. Socialist regimes. Okay? We can use artificial intelligence and blockchain to get to eliminate the bureaucracy and to support the people's power like kind of things. So we can use it. Or how to plan the economy. Okay, experts will do this. You will have the best experts, but the human beings have some have a limited capacity and we have a long history of experiences and you know and we have large population but we can use an artificial intelligence to help us for a good plan. So this is a political choice <coughs> to invest these issues. But you can but now in the current system all these investments are done for either financial markets to get more profits, Bitcoin and all other coins, or artificial intelligence is used to control workers in human resources, or uh, they are used for the military services. So this is the main issue. I think it is very clear now to explain people if there is a kind of alternative to the existing system and how kind of an alternative you, we are imagining so you can explain this with these kind of very concrete things in our life so we all have these technologies but why don't we use this for this but we use this for like if social media is a great thing if you want to have a direct democracy but you use we, we use social the social media is used to manipulate people this is your choice you know so uh, this political issue is, I think this is a very important side of the political struggle so I thought this would be a kind of question and so I didn't want to go a lot in my presentation so this is an issue uh, and in today's world maybe in we are talking about the refugee crisis I don't want to I don't define it as a crisis but you know refugee question like uh, so we are talking about thousands, millions of people uh, are on the move and uh, we can make very concrete uh, real-time predictions based on this mobile phone data and you know so all this information is coming so you cannot hide anything for example, when Turkish government makes a statement about the living conditions of Syrian refugees in Turkey, I find it very ridiculous, for example, for the world. Maybe it is ridiculous for the people who are writing these statements, because uh, all these corp big corporations, like in the technology uh, market, like Google, Twitter, Facebook, yeah. These are united with the United States government, so they are not. You cannot differentiate these companies and states. So they know everything about the Syrian refugees in Turkey. They have all the information. Yeah. But you know, it's not important what you write in your state, uh, because this this can control. It. But they, for example, China doesn't allow for well, China has its own internet, Twitter, China has its own Google, China has all. And China is controlling its own people there. Russia does the same thing. So if you use Google or Yandex, it has different results. You give information to others. So, this, so we are talking about the five large corporations based in the US. But there are very big corporations in China and Russia and they do the same thing, they, they have similar attitudes towards their people but this didn't create kind of a global region, you know, so it maybe eliminated some of more sovereignty from the 
developing countries, in these dependent countries. So you cannot oppose, you know, you, you, you cannot hide any, anything from these corporations, from these countries. So you do not have to, you know, the U.S. doesn't need to send so many intelligence agents to Turkey to find something. You know, because people are voluntarily using all these corporates and sharing data with them. So if you have this data, you have that power. Uh, however, these national nation states of these new capitalist imperialist states are strengthened with these technological developments. So they have more control. They can predict the crisis. They can predict the Illnesses, they can predict the um, even uh, rebellions. So, uh, of course, they can do it, but it doesn't mean that they can <coughs> solve it. So, the problem for this system is they cannot solve these crises. You know all these issues, but you cannot. This is another main debate. So, even in the EU Turkey deal, uh, for refugees, uh, so we again see this kind of national borders. Uh, again, uh, you know, choosing who to come here. It's you know, so you you don't want everyone to come here. You want to select these people. So this EU EU Turkey deal or EU's deal with Libya in, on the refugee question, it's not about just stopping all refugees or immigrants. They just want to choose themselves. And they all have this kind of necessary infrastructure, technology, they use all this technology, and then they can just choose and pick the ones who they think they can, uh, you know, have, you know, you know, they can, for example, pick the most skilled ones, for example, you know, you know, kind of things, for example. It, yeah. Yeah. So it depends. So because, so all these deals, first to increase these you know, deals and also these technological developments, if we uh, connect these two issues together, they increase this kind of surveillance of people and uh, they strengthen the walls. Uh, of the nation states, but some of the nation states, not all, of course. But also, they allow these states uh, to manage this migration movement. So, if you start using these kind of human resources terms in the social sciences, like management kind of things, then you start uh, focus. You start focusing on people who have some kind of unique abilities, uh, for example, by using this kind of technology or by having some kind of education, by having some certain skills that can be picked uh, by and uh, chosen by the northern states or the European states. So this is the... I, uh, maybe this can be an interesting debate apart from the role of the technology in the humanitarian need, but this can be another issue. Uh, yeah. mm. So, I, I'm not sure uh, about the future of the division of labor, but there are two issues now we can see from these developments. The first is there will be new jobs like this the workers of the artificial intelligence in <coughs> poor countries. Uh, and, yeah. And second is um, instead of losing these jobs, you know, humans will start work learning how to work together with some artificial workmates. So, for example, here, a very recent research predicts that people 
the workers in almost all industries will start sharing 30% of their existing workload with robots about 30% maybe some in some industries it can be 80% some industries can be 10% but in average we will share about 30% of our works with these artificial intelligence uh, algorithms but this can be we can estimate it from the computers like before everything it should be written down you know there were many people uh, working to uh, keep these archives you know these it was you know but with the computers we don't do this we just upload them to clouds and you know we don't need to print out everything and sign you know before everything was printed out, everything was signed, everything was archived, you know, so when you ask you who are going to the uh, archive and trying to find the necessary document and, you know, all these paperwork. Now we don't have these paperwork. But maybe in the next stage we will start talking with, and maybe in some areas we start talking with the machines, or the machines will start talking with us. And it is, there's many interesting cases of these al uh, programs used in the human resources because they can follow you in your home even with these applications can follow you at your home out of the work times they can follow your or they can calculate your productivity they can compare your productivity with other colleagues or with your own job history and for example you can we seem to work in your office and in the computer, but maybe you are playing a game there. We are not focusing on something, but this application in your com uh, computer can inform this uh, to the human resources. Or, it's now very usual now in our daily life, when you go to your workplace, you just show your card, and then when you go out, you again show your card. So, the company knows how many hours you are in that uh, work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very, so no, it's very normal showing the card and coming to entering to work this kind. So uh, this all, uh, all, so all these cameras, you know. So this is not something. It's not something that we we can have in the next ten years. This is what we are facing now and what uh, all these computer scientists <coughs> are working on it. So, for instance, in Oxford, as I said, there are some kind of uh, labor labs or institutes discussing ethics, politics, legal uh, aspects of this artificial intelligence. And recently, there was a book was published by Oxford University Press, written by very famous professors about the ethics of the artificial intelligence. Who funded this book? Elon Musk. So the oh, the Tesla CEO, CEO, Elon Musk gave two million pounds to Oxford University, and these people wrote the ethics of it. Or another uh, institute is working on driver's cars, and one of a Turkish academic is also working there. So. They get this funding from it, from Toyota because Toyota understood that they are not good in this driverless car uh, area. So they want to reach their competitors. So they gave millions of pounds to Oxford University and many of the academics that are working for them. So if we leave all these to these corporations, if you corporations who decide all uh, all aspects of this uh, development or this technological revolution that this is a there is a problem like in the Cambridge Analytica scandal there is no any illegality this everything is illegal these 50 million Facebook pages isn't stolen it was given legally collected it, yeah it it's a say for an academic purpose. It was given. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And then they asked, Facebook asked them, did you delete it? And they said, yes, I did, kind of thing. 
but you can use all this, this then you start using it for psychological tests for behavioral change yeah so I think these 10 points of the union, trade union is important we can add more or we can delete some of them it's, I'm not talking about just content but I think this is the time when trade unions, revolutionaries, socialists or democrats, you know, whatever you define yourself or all these groups started discussing our own ethics our own uh, you know, politics of it you know. how can we control this issue how can, what is the ethics of the like, working class if you want to define it on artificial intelligence yeah. uh, so it, this or how uh, can trade unions uh, add some articles on the collective agreements because this is not just about the technological companies technology companies produce and sell these issues but they are used by all other corporations in the retailers for example they use human resources use it so a garment uh, trade union or a, a metal trade union in metallurgy industry kind of all these they should know about it because they will have these kind of things uh, I, I think uh, that's a more urgent issue now but we are more likely to discuss, you know, if our will robots take our jobs, what will be, you know, these kind of things. These are very important as well. But I think we have, this is these issues are more urgent because this is about the democracy. If you talk about these social media issues, so about the elections, so I don't know if there is any need for an election now, you know, because millions of people can be manipulated very well, easily, or. Uh, Maybe or about this, the industrial relations. How we will work? How how much we will we allow our this our workplaces or our employers to observe us? These are the main issues that I think we should discuss uh, very urgently. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Sam, um, what, what, what I noticed, whatever you have explained to us and the answers for the questions, uh, we are all surrounded by the artificial intelligence, we can't do anything. When I was watching news a few months ago in Turkey, I have noticed that in the very far village, the, the education program started doing some kind of coding. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked, what's the point of teaching them coding and what's the aim of the feature of coding this and uh, last week I met with one of my friend's daughter here and we were helping her for homework she's a primary school student and she was taught uh, answering um, solving a problem by using maths in a totally different way what I notice is it is not a proper general maths and that it is some kind of Coding is embedded into the mass, and I was and I was shocked actually because I said I just picking up two things to see the big picture. Some educational policies has been changed in my country, and coding uh, is entered into the system. I don't think so that there is got, there is a special base of it because when I think about my country's educational previous policies, as I'm a teacher from Turkey. And I, I, I look at Turkey from here, and I compare this child here, she's learning coding, and the other children learning coding over there. And I was thinking that when I'm using bank, when I call the, uh, the support service, someone else answering me from India, and then I said, what's going on? So they have already started, as you said, brain drain from the poor countries by uh, putting by, by changing their policies, educational policies, in order to pick uh, the best brains to their countries, actually. So, what can we do for this? It, this is serious, not for all us, uh, for here, for Turkey, or for any other countries. It's all over the world, and that they have been done by the politicians, 
as if it is a wonderful improvement in the country. No, it is when you look at the back side of the improvement, it is totally a kind of politics of the brain drain from the countries. Um, it's very, very interesting talk and interesting uh, discussion where we're, we're, we're heading. Um, there's an irony, though, in terms of the impact of these technologies you're talking about on the politics of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Because for the last 10 years, despite the uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, geometric increase in the potential of all these communication technologies and so on, and artificial intel, intel, intel intelligence, the capitalist economy on a global scale, and particularly in Britain and the United States to some, to some extent, has seen a marked slowing in productivity mm -hmm. increase, increases. So what each worker is producing per hour is not, in Britain it's hardly increased at all, in the United States only increased at a slow, at a slow, at a slow rate. And in fact it's a global slow, slow, slow down compared to the rate of pro productivity increase uh, before the crash of 2008. So it's the last 10 years that we've seen this in particular. And it's kind of ironic because what is the new technology if it isn't facilitating a sort of massive increase in productivity and everyone's afraid of losing their jobs and robots uh, doing all the work. What that means is the few workers who are left are in effect producing a whole lot more stuff in terms of use val 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 use to use a Marx Marxist term. So it's interesting, I think, to to try and work out what's going on there, whether it's simply a consequence of the crash, and whether uh, the uh, as from a Marxist perspective, I see the crash happening because of uh, I think it's a something to do with the rate of profit uh, and uh, uh, I think as a result of that and uh, the uh, overhang of debt you're actually getting firms uh, are more reluctant to invest mm -hmm. and so on so there's that element to do with it the level of investment particularly in uh, in Europe and North America and Japan is lower than it was mm -hmm. be before it's also potentially the nature of the technological changes we're seeing, because to the extent that um, use values are being produced online, electronic mm -hmm. things are being sold, then uh, uh, in Marxist terms, they're not, although they're not, because the marginal cost of producing extra, there's an initial investment, mm -hmm. what someone called Jeremy Rifkin in the United States is not a Marxist, talked about the marginal zero mm -hmm. marginal cost economy mm -hmm. that uh, it doesn't actually from producing one use value to producing a billion for the whole planet if you're talking in terms of electronic books or films mm -hmm. or other services that are distributed over the internet there's no extra cost involved there's no extra labor involved so in terms of, of value no extra value is produced at mm -hmm. all so there's that aspect of it, which is potentially a crisis for the United States. And Paul Mason, for instance, in his post-capitalism mm -hmm. book, refers to that as well, and is saying that this, and Jeremy Rifkin does also, in terms of the potential for this to spread to other sectors, of, to things that are produced physically as well. Uh, and so potentially it's that, but I, I'm, I'm not actually sure, because this is a 10-year-old phenomenon, mm -hmm. just because it's been happening over the last 10 years doesn't mean it's going to continue indefinitely. So uh, we could be a consequence, consequence of the crash and so on, or it could be some deeper, more profound crisis for the political economy of capitalism. So you have lost the boosterism, if you like, saying how fantastic it is and capitalism is uh, sort of uh, transforming things. And there is, and, and that's true as well, uh, although, I think we need to emphasise that what this technology is doing really is uh, bringing together technologies 
like the tel telephone communication technologies that were invented quite a long time ago, a hundred years ago when you're talking about the phone and, and televisions which were invented 70 or 80 years, years ago and bringing them together in uh, innovative ways uh, that wasn't done b b before. So uh, it's the combination of te technol te technol technology that's having the biggest impact rather than uh, 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 a completely transformative new things being invented. There's a guy called Robert Gold, 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 and in the United States, who's written about the dearth of new inventions, actually, although we're talking about all these things, and that the rate, and that the kind of inventions that happened until 30 years ago were even were more transformed than the kind of inventions we're seeing now in terms of the car and electricity and water going into houses, just all the, the actual transformation of people's life. You were born in 1900 and lived to 1970, the transformations you would have seen in terms of transport and how you actually lived, refrigerators, planes, all that kind of thing, are actually more transformative than the stuff we've been seeing since 1970. So I think it's interesting to think of it in those long-term perspectives as well. Somebody yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's fascinating in details, especially. Uh, one question: When you were talking about blockchain, you mentioned decentralization. How accountability will be maintained, mm -hmm. if ever? And a thought: Unless the power change hands, I don't think technology. Uh, will change anything, it will just enhance the exploitation. Um, and I was thinking uh, 40 years ago uh, when we are learning what's happening in the world from one newspaper, two newspaper or five newspaper owned one person by one person, um, our views were uh, shaped by it. So in my childhood, I was thinking uh, Iran Shah mm -hmm. is a great guy, modern guy, but we know later that uh, he, he's a torture, etc. Now it is done by uh, many corporations, um, and you mentioned already three, four networks. Okay, three people. Yeah. So many things. Mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah, yeah, so. I think this is a very interesting area because it's very new, so everything you can discuss and we don't have any specific solution <laughs> answer to everything. So, <laughs> so it's interesting to have these kind of uh, questions. So, uh, as you mentioned, I think this is also related with, to the current crisis of capitalism. So, as I said, this artificial intelligence debate or study works started in 1950s in the UK, in the Britain, Britain. So from 1950s to almost a few years before today, you know, there haven't been many works. So you know, there were but, you know, it wasn't really affecting our daily lives. Or about the blockchain technology, about the bitcoins, for example, they started in 1990s. Uh, so, so after the crisis, maybe it's because of his rates of profits, because of the productivity, then you start in, the corporation started investing in these technologies, and suddenly these technologies improved very fast. And now we understand that if you start, um, you know, in, so we are in this early stage of this improvements, and we see this. Uh, changes in our life and then you say what would happen ten years later, you know? So ten years ago there wasn't iPhone, there wasn't a smartphone. Now we can't live without a smartphone. A few years ago and five years ago there wasn't these kind of applications. Now we are using many applications. And all or we give permission to all these applications to access our photos, personal information, all these kind of things, you know. Yeah, and we don't know the real intention. Like for example, this Facebook scandal. 
it was just the academic survey of 250,000 people, or these kind of people, 250,000. However, if you do not have in sufficient privacy, you know, because we just take what we have, so this application could reach all your Facebook friends. So about 250,000 people, from 250,000 people, they reach to 50 million people. But everything is legal, there is no any problem. So 50, millions, uh, 50 million people's data is harvested, and then they started playing on this data. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is what we see from today, in, a, in this few years' time. So, we can have a very dystopic future, or we can have a very uh, utopic future as well. So, because we know that everything we can do, you know, in this famous book of Homo Deus, is it? Yeah. 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 it means, so the humanity takes the, all the God's power. <coughs> now God creates and does everything, now we can do all the God's power. And now there are many studies on immortality. So now, for example, now, yeah, maybe in a 10 years or 20 years time, living 150 years will be a normal thing. No. For example, uh, 20 years ago, who we consider as an old? But For those who can afford it. Uh, yes. Of course, it yes, yeah. class problem. Yeah, but, yeah, yes, true. but but all this, again, now living eight or ninety years is not a big issue for us, is it? If someone dies at seventies, we say, "Oh, very early," isn't it? So it affects our lives as well. So it's, it's of course class issue, but it also it cannot be stopped easily. So it also helps other people. We all have these smartphones now. Before we couldn't have. We can't live without them. Yeah. We have these many, you know, in all industries or in health, in technology, we all have, we use these kind of big changes. So, uh, this is the, I think, again, it's this contradiction. So you try to increase your profits. You invest in technology, but that technology doesn't bring you that profit because of this, maybe this value, um, all these, um, again, these Marxist concepts that we have used. Yeah. So it doesn't solve this crisis. Then we see more monopolization. You know, it's very easy for us to count if few corporations, and I think it's a kind of this is the kind of unity of the contradiction. Right? If you have all this data, then you don't know what to do with all this data. You know everything, but it, it makes, I think, it is, this is a difficult issue for corporations as well. They have all this data, but this is another problem. So how can you use all this data? In what way? We are talking about 6 billion people. And we are talking about all enorm enormous uh, data. So. Uh, so I think it is understood by these corporations or by states. So they will invest and they prepare for a war. Yeah. They prepare. They in, use all this technology to control people. But so. But this also creates its opposite. Uh, the solution is new question. Yes. Because it creates, for example, Twitter is used to control us or manipulate us. But during the Gezi Park protest, Twitter was is a kind of big tool for us. We were using Twitter to understand where the police is and when, and when people are out in the streets. You know, your police or your armed forces may not mean anything. And that technology can work against you. You know, we can use that technology. Okay, Facebook can try to manipulate us, but we can create our own spaces as well. Yeah. For example, did you hear about the online strike of IBM workers in Turkey? 
Mm. So they went on an online strike and they forced IBM to recognize the union. They signed a collective agreement. Was it on? What it was an online strike. How? How? I don't know how they did it, <laughs> but they were at the work. I think basically they were at the workplace. Yeah. But they didn't do this online thing, all the works, because they're programmers, oh, you know, right. this, you know, so they got on strike. So they didn't do, they didn't create anything. But they, legally, they are on the workplace, you know, so they are working kind of. So, you know, for example, there are so many new initiatives of the, or militant movements of computer program developers, kind of these kind of things. You know, we know, we can, we know we can get information about anything in different parts of the world. So this is also this can be used for new oppositional movements. So now we we don't have to accept that word, but I think it's interesting. So I like it. This is this own life. So this technology, this being on life, forces all children to learn coding. We can't stop this, and I think these developments, this is, you know, everything has this good side and side. But it's very exciting if we or creates more infrastructure for a future of society. So maybe we were unlucky in the 20th century when all these revolutions were um, re done. You know, so there were socialist governments there in many parts of the world, but they don't have this kind of technology. They of course, they were technology progressed because of these revolutions or systems. But you know, they didn't have this artificial intelligence or this blockchain then that time. Maybe everything would be different. Or in our future uh, society, we can imagine a more participatory, more democratic, you know, uh, a, a world and it will not be very utopian. We can just use our current technological level. So this is another issue. But then when you look at all these uh, military spendings, when you look at all these surveillance, you can find very dystopic issue. Then maybe it is, uh, uh, yeah, you. It's a kind of a crucial point that uh, you be, you have to change that system. So that's you know that's because we go more crisis. We are the all countries are preparing for wars, a war. So there is more aggression in the world. There is more crisis. But it is not sustainable. But there is an alternative. But this, there is no any strong alternative force that can overcome this kind of things. But because okay, these create more surveillance or more exploitation from one end. But it's also these developments also improve our lives. So we are not living in isolated villages. We are. Uh, you know, we are benefiting from this technology as well. So I can come from Oxford to here without asking anyone. Yeah. Yeah, I cannot. Of course, this is a kind of luxury when I come to do my home, the coffee machine understands that I'm coming up to the coffee. You know, this is a kind of, <laughs> this is a kind of luxury. I don't need it now. But maybe 10 years later, we can't live without it. <laughs> you know, when, in ten, when there is a problem, maybe we do. Uh, be very angry. I am at home and there is no coffee. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> Maybe you know. On that issue, on that issue, Mr. Bender, we need to finish in ten minutes. I should first because she didn't speak at all. <laughs> I just wonder uh, about the, how this affects the human psychology. Mm. In the is there any research? Because my belief is. The psychology side is really important for politics and that the world changes for the future new generation. And uh, I can't see how does it change it now. But is there any research okay. about this? Okay, I think I can ask you so if you don't have more time. Yeah, so 
this is very interesting. There are many researchers on this issue, but I think you should watch this channel force undercover this about uh, Cambridge Analytica. So a guy works as a research leader is explaining how they work and says, I can understand your fears and hopes and I can give you a message according to these fears and hopes. So their work is basically as a data company to change the behaviors of the people. So for example, they target certain people. Firstly, if you are not decided who to vote in the US elections, but if you are a member of a um, associations, you know, who goes hunting and these kind of things, then you will get a message that Hillary Clinton will ban all these arms, you know. And then you, you then uh, decide you should vote for Trump. And then you will go and mobilize your association because you want to continue your hunting. Or if you are a white American, you get a message that Black Liberation Movement votes for Hillary. Okay, if they vote for it, I will vote for it. In Brexit discussion, they said Turks are coming yeah. into the European Union. They will invade all Europe. They said. Yeah, Turks are coming here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't right. That, that, everything. Uh, that was just. Uh, that was an exaggeration. Yeah. <laughs> but also, but for example. If you are a black American, but if you are not very educated, but and, but if you are not very rich and poor, you know, kind of skilled worker, okay, you get a message about a kind of a racist statement of Hillary Clinton. Yeah. No, you won't vote for Trump, but you won't go vote voting for Hillary Clinton. Because if you are very well educated, a black person, you will not believe it. But if you are in that middle, or if you are a white working class uh, man, then you will get a different message. Or sometimes, the messages, for example, you get is that the people that you don't like is organizing and very active, then you start that these messages will force you to start a new grassroots movement. Because you know that in your neighborhood something is happening, but this is, is all not true. So, based on your Facebook account, based on what you like, we are, it is possible to understand all your fears and hopes. So, you can get these tailored messages. But, another difference. When you read a before, for example, we are all reading this paper, and you know that your neighbor has a kind of tendency to vote for a right party. You read the same magazine, newspaper, and you can go and talk with, chat with that person, with your neighbor, and you say, all oh, these are lie. Come on, this is the reality, and you can try to convince. But now, all the messages, newsfeed on your Facebook, is different. It's all tailored for you. So you get different messages, and you don't know what he gets. Mm -hmm. So you cannot think that, oh, if he reads this, that I should go and convince some kind of things. You know? So you don't know what that person has done. So we are living in a situation, we get information from everywhere, but we are all manipulated that we are living in different worlds. Like in, okay, let's do... Fake news. Yeah. It's not necessarily be a fake news as well. Yeah, it can be fake news. But it doesn't necessarily be a fake news. What you get is important. So, look, let's talk with people in Turkey. It's a very highly polarized country. So, there are different Turkeys. For some people, Turkey is very, you know, going in a very bad direction. And, you know, people are leaving Turkey. You know, they don't, they, people are losing their hopes. But in, for some people, Turkey is conquering other places, we are just going back to Ottoman time, everything is going well, we have a real leader. Because you get some information information from same things and it's found that you do not people do not follow the other people other ideas. People you follow the people like you think yours, you know, but you know so 
you follow the similar people with similar ideologies. So this is a kind of challenging. So it's very they do not do anything illegal. Maybe they do not send you fake messages, but they share specific news with you that triggers your fears. And this should we should think about this how to oppose these kind of things. Yeah. A way of augmented reality. Okay, it's uh, one. Uh, how many minutes we got? We don't have. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Uh, two minutes. Uh, Basically, I would, I want to start saying that, uh, I think, technology moves in mode of production. Even from the start, when we want to do what to do, I mean, if you, uh, Ismail and myself want to innovate something, what we will in innovate, we have to think about the market. Number one, we lost. Number two, who's going to put the implementation? We lost again because the company may put it into the drawer and forget about it. So on and so forth. So technology is molded in the mode of production. And the mode of production we are living in is um, quantity quality. Whatever you are explaining is all quantity, not quality, what my friend asked about psychology and etc. This is quality. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to think about the analytics, etc. I'm sorry about the time. I have to come to the conclusion immediately. Reform or revolution is a very essential point to discuss and agree on that. Because the development is so fast and so destructive. If we have to think about how can we intrude to the, the, the trade unions, how can we use in our benefits and etc., which needs to be done, but at the same time the main focus is to take the power into our hands. The essential and required now, because. We are, especially Turkey is a very con contrasting country, we, we are now facing something that the Kurdish people in, in, with these drones and etc. kindled all, all, every, every day. So by facing it, I am not benefiting. As well, the capitalism is not in the um, development phase. It is in the completely different phase, which is neoliberal eco economy, turning to the post-neoliberal economy, etc. So when we look at this, the, really the technology is against us. People are not anymore believing in God. They are creating a God to control, to influence, and etc. Better than the... the um, uh, the books like Koran or uh, in Bible, uh, they will say do this and do that, and in the end, anyway, they will come into your brain. So it is really what you are explaining is horrid. I see that it is horrid. So taking the power into our hand, uh, setting up a social society, has become paramount. Okay. No time. No time. No time. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.